Well, hello and welcome to uh, the webinar on sensory sensitivities. Uh, thank you, Allison, and uh, thank you to um, Therapro for allowing me to do this today. Um, I'm, it's very exciting to be here uh, with you. As you know, I'm uh, Karen Moore and the author of the Sensory Connection books. Um, uh, <clears throat> once I wrote the books, I started uh, doing uh, sensory programs and workshops all over the country and I even up in Canada um, for a, a broad variety of audiences, mostly in mental health. But I also did a huge conference in uh, the San Francisco area for their special needs um, programs there. And I've been to many um, adolescent units and even did a preschool once. That was a lot of fun. So the thing is that this program is applicable across the lifespan. I have an interesting opportunity to tell you about. Um, I'm going to be doing a workshop, an online workshop. I never imagined myself doing something like this, but an online workshop uh, for, for the Canadian Association for Occupational Therapists. And this is a unique opportunity because Canada allows uh, therapists from other countries to join or register for their work workshop. Um, so this is a very rare opportunity to um, hear me speak if that's something that you're interested in. The workshop will be offered twice, once in September and at the end of um, October. And I'll be presenting with my colleagues, Betty, <clears throat> Peggy Ninao and Megan Flood. And um, they will be doing the live webinar part and the uh, lab, so to speak, and I'm doing the whole recordings. So let's be sensitive to sensory issues. That's what I'm hoping will happen here today. I'm hoping that I'll raise your sensitivity to the possibilities of uh, sensory issues and uh, particularly um, people who are hypersensitive, um, but we'll be talking about lots of it sensory issues in general. Um, so this poor kid, you wonder what's happening with her. And it could be a variety of, of causes for what's happening. Uh, she could be overwhelmed. Her demands might be too high. She could be feeling scared. She might have had a bad morning and was doing okay. And then something happened at school and she totally lost it. Or she might be in sensory overload or hypersensitivities could uh, be the root cause here. And we have to be careful um, that we don't interpret every behavior we see as something sensory. Um, but occupational therapists are in the unique position of understanding that that is a real possibility. And if this is uh, sensory in nature, you can have all the um, programs in the world to help her with her behaviors. And um, it's not going to work if sensory is the true cause underneath. So you need to be a sleuth. You have to start considering the sensory possibilities, um, especially when behaviors seem inexplicable. Um, maybe the person, this is out of their character. This isn't something they usually do. When an outburst comes out of the blue, you don't see the reason for it. Nobody sees the reason for it, and the person just all of a sudden loses it. Um, and also when tried and true interventions don't seem to work. So I have two stories that interestingly are very similar. One came from Albany, Georgia when I went down to a wonderful program down there called Aspire um, and they told me the story and the other one came I think from the program in the San Francisco area. And the first story is about a young fellow with autism and um, he was doing pretty well in school. Um, but one morning when he got into the classroom, he started acting out and screaming and having a really difficult time and very out of character for him and no one knew what the heck was going on. So they um, brought him up uh, to see the um, uh, nurse and to, you know, just to let him calm down, which he did. Um, and once they calmed him down and everything seemed fine, they said, okay, well, let's go back down to the classroom. They went back down to the classroom and the same thing happened. So they went back to the nurse's uh, room and called in OT to see if um, maybe they could 
think of what was going on here. Um, after a few questionings, um, the, the boy was kind of reticent to say too much, um, but um, finally figured out that, um, you know, when asking, what's wrong? What's going on? Was it, you know, did something happen to you? Did somebody say something? No, no. Was there, you know, what bothered you? It smelled, he said. Oh, it smelled. How bad did it smell? It smells, he said. And, um, well, what does it smell like? Does it smell like garbage? No. Does it smell like perfume? No. Does it smell like chemicals? Yes. So uh, the OT went down. The room seemed fine to her. She couldn't smell anything. So she went and talked to the janitor. Hey, have you been using any different chemicals uh, lately? Oh, yeah, he said, I got this new product. It's really great. I went in the room and I wiped down everything. And, oh, it's just spanking clean and I'm really proud of it. Well, she said, I hate to tell you, but I think you know, our young, we have a young gentleman that had a very hard time with the smell of that. So they uh, went down, rewashed all the um, desks again, and um, the little boy was able to tolerate it that day. Um, and um, when they actually got in contact with the parent, it turns out that he had been reacting to um, strong chemical type smells and they were being very careful at home but never thought to tell the school that, that this might be a problem. Um, the second story, very similar, was a youth with ADHD, uh, kind of a fellow who, a wonderful kid, but um, often getting himself in trouble, um, going down to the principal, um, which was pretty common. And so he walks in the principal's office and he loses it. He just knocked everything on her desk right off and started screaming. So she said, I think we need to take a walk. So she went out with him and walked him down to the um, uh, counselor, the, the, um, in, the, in the school, the school counselor. And in the meantime, um, he did settle down a little bit. Um, so what's going on? He asked him, what, what happened? Um, I don't know. Was there something there that bothered you? I don't know. He obviously didn't want to talk about it. Maybe he didn't know. So the, um, the counselor went, I mean, the, yeah, the guidance counselor, um, went down and the principal went back to her, her, um, her room to see if they could figure out, you know, what the heck could have been? Did he see something? Did, you know, what was out of place? And they could find nothing until the um, principal noticed that she had put a Glade plug-in into the wall a couple days before. So they went back and asked the fellow if possibly that he had smelled something that bothered him. Yes. Do you know what it was? No. Well, why did it bother you? I don't know. Well, it turns out he had a trauma history and this smell of the Glade set something off. So very different reasons for what looked like a very similar problem. Um, so these are the behaviors that we look for that can be related to over-responsivity, aggression or impulsivity when somebody's overwhelmed by the sensory stimulation. They might become unsociable or avoid group activities or trouble with the relationships. They can be uncomfortable in lines or crowds or excessively cautious, afraid to try new things, resistant to change, difficulty with transitions, irritable, fussy, moody, difficult, noisy, hectic places like the cafeteria, you start seeing, you know, several of these kinds of um, behaviors, you start asking yourself, could, could some kind of sensory over-responsibility be the uh, cause of it? So I love this quote from Tina Champagne, who has done some wonderful work uh, using sensory modalities. Um, people seek what they need, adaptively or maladaptively, and they might, um, 
you know, avo avoiding is actually not such a maladaptive strategy for someone who's having a very hard time. At least they're they're taking over and they're doing something about it. But we really start um, questioning this whole sensory thing when we start seeing real maladaptive behaviors like head banging or um, uh, biting or or self self injurious type things. Uh, we really want to know what's behind this. And it's not always sensory, but it could be. So Winnie Dunn, uh, we'll talk about her her, um, her her evaluation later. But she breaks us sensory processing patterns into sort of four patterns. The high, the first two are the uh, the higher. Uh, upper ones are what people who have a very high threshold and so it takes a lot of sensory input to get up to that threshold um, so they're hyposensitive they're not as sensitive they miss sensory cues um, and then there's sort of the bystander type of um, way of approaching it or it can be a seeker a sensory seeker trying to get that input that they really need so again two different approaches uh, to this problem you need to be careful of the bystander even though they're not seeking it out you might not realize that they're hyposensitive so you really you know need to be aware of that pattern as well we're going to focus on the hypersensitive end where the threshold is very low and easily hit very easily set off and again two sort of typical response patterns one is the sensor the sensor manage the input but still if it's getting bad enough they'll finally lose it but again like the one above them it's a little harder to see the hypersensitive avoider just withdraws avoids and controls and again some helping the person you gotta look for reasons for the behavior, but it can just look like it's a behavioral problem still. So sensitivities are on a continuum. So we have hyposensitivities down one end, we have the whole middle range where you and I might fit, although you might be a sensitive person, so you might be drifted up to the more sensitive end, or I'm kind of a hyposensitive person. I can tolerate a lot, a lot of noise, a lot of uh, discomfort, a lot of anything, and I just tend to ignore it. It's still in the normal range. And the reason that makes it normal is it doesn't interrupt anything for me. It doesn't interrupt my ability to um, do anything or to be, you know, have be active in all my roles and so on. Um, so that's where, you know, when we worry about these things, when they start interfering with um, performance. So at the one end, the other end with the hypersensitivities, if it really gets bad, it get, can get um, almost diagnosed as being defensive, which is the far end of that continuum. So sensory defensiveness are abnormal reactions to things most people wouldn't even notice. Uh, they're hypersensitive, they have a low threshold. Their experience is abnormal. You have to remember that. It's abnormal. They have an increased startle reflex. They're much harder to calm down. Uh, they have avoidance and control issues. And th these are issues. These aren't just avoiding the input. These are real avoidance and control issues. Some input can almost feel painful. A shower can feel painful. It feels so terrible to them. And self-injurious behaviors are common. I did a study on sensory defensiveness in people with mental illnesses and um, really learned a lot uh, doing that study. And so um, it really it's something that really interests me. Um, when I worked at the state hospital, we had a, a, a story which is typical in the sense that it was a misinterpretation of behavior. There was this 41-year-old man on the unit I was working on, the specialized treatment unit. Uh, he had a diagnosis of pervasive developmental disorder, a history in the past of some pretty violent explosions of emotion. But he was doing better. He was making progress, and he was doing much better overall. And he had, hadn't had any of those explosions and, and really was doing quite well. But he started refusing the showers and changing his clothes. And this caused a huge struggle with the evening staff, who saw it as a behavioral issue. And so OT was called in because they saw it as maybe an ADL issue 
um, every night there was this huge struggle going on. He wanted him to get in the shower, he's refusing, he wouldn't give up his clothing, and so on. So when I sat down with him and talked to him um, and asked him, you know, what's going on? Why, why don't you want to change your clothes? He said, because they just hand me back a bunch of clothes that are scratchy and itchy and I hate them. I just get used to those and they want to change them again. Well, he was a ward of the state, didn't have his own things. And those clothes, he was right. They would just hand them this, this right probably down from the laundry downstairs where they could have used uh, any kind of um, uh, um, chemicals or, or, you know, products on these clothes. Um, so it wasn't really about the shower. It was that when he went in the shower, they'd take these clothes away. So I did a sensory eval on him to look at the sensory defensiveness. And sure enough, he, I saw it across many different characteristics, but um, he was very tactically defensive. So we went down to the hospital thrift store and, and got him a whole slew of really comfortable clothes that he picked out, taught him how to wash the clothes, and then what do you know? No more issues, no more fighting with staff. He was perfectly happy. This wasn't about behavior. They could have done behavioral programs with him till they were blue in the face. Wouldn't have helped. He had a sensory issue. And the thing is, why did it happen then? Well, because he was doing better. And all of a sudden, he felt strong enough and, and confident enough to say no for the first time. And hence the problem. Um, so sensory defensiveness treatment. I did a literature review in preparation for that uh, Canadian conference. And uh, it determined that the treatment uh, sense for this was uh, positive results, but extensive research is needed. This is very true. Systemic review of the effectiveness of the Will Barger protocol, which was what I used uh, with the women that I worked with in my study. But it determined that uh, even though there's emerging evidence of the protocol in modulating cortisol levels, improving behavior, and increasing social and school participation, there's still a lack of high quality evidence. So the evidence does not yet support or refute the use of this intervention. Does that mean we don't do it? No, it's, but if it's working for the person, that's fine. But we have to realize that, um, you know, if we're truly following the research, it's something that, you know, we need to be a little bit careful about. I believe that clients still benefit from understanding these abnormal reactions. This was very true of the women and they benefit from well-tolerated, enriching, strong sensory input provided on a regular basis. You might call that a sensory diet. Be my tapping, which we'll talk about later, has been shown to be very helpful, and strategies can be identified in practice to help them cope with, with this aversive and dysregulating sensory input. Now, here's a question. Is it sensory or is it trauma? When I talked about those two different stories, one fellow, it was purely a sensory issue. It was high, he was overly sensitive to that chemical smell. The other fellow, it was a particular smell that was set off by trauma. And we have to realize that that possibility is there as well. Very often, if the hypersensitivity is trauma-related, it will be a specific to something that has to do, a trigger that has to do with the trauma, might not be as generalized. But what happens is after a while, sometimes they become more hypersensitive or defensive, and so the lines are blurred. Uh, we have to remember that the incidence of trauma in children is surprisingly high. The incidence of trauma in children with disability is outrageously high. Each year, the number of youths requiring hospital treatment for physical assault related injuries would fill every seat in nine stadiums. One in four high school students was at least in one fight. One in five high school students were bullied at school or experienced cyberbullying. And 19% of injured and 12% of physically ill youth have post-traumatic stress disorder. Those are high statistics. So if you think that uh, you know, maybe you, this isn't something that's found in your school, then um, more than likely it's there, you just don't know about it.
People who have experienced this trauma and neglect feel frightened and unsafe. Making them feel safe is huge. They feel out of control of their choices and emotions. Primitive responses prevail. They'll just, you know, lose it very quickly if they are if they're triggered they're stuck in this fight or flight a freeze mode which is ineffective and dangerous and it takes a terrible psychological toll the sensory system actually makes faulty adjustments causing ongoing perceptual abnormalities and sometimes have hypersensitivities and impaired responses to sensory input they can't self-soothe and sometimes they resort to maladaptive behaviors so again, just to reiterate, the sensory issues with defensiveness seen with trauma has a little different pathology. Hypersensitivities can occur across all the sensory domains. So we're going to talk about those kind of briefly. Um, The auditory domain, you know, we start seeing hands over the ears, difficulty working with background noise, fearful of certain sounds, um, dislikes of something like theater and concerts. And, you know, these, these kinds of auditory problems are starting to interfere with their ability to stay in school, to be able to study. They might have difficulty during tests with all the noise. You might have to make some accommodations for them. Um, think of the um, middle schooler who would love to go to a theater or concert with his buddies, but he just can't because he just gets so um, uncomfortable in that environment um, with a theater. So we might be able to come up with strategies to help. We might be able to work with that person. Um, just a couple of auditory strategies. The white noise is always good. Um, having a um, sound machine, sometimes you can, you know, plug them into a sound machine, have them have them choose a sound that they are comfortable with to give themselves a break. And um, one therapist called it their auditory safe space. I really liked that idea. Um, you might give them some headphones to cut down on the um, on the noise. However, we don't want them using the headphones all the time. We do want to work with them to be able to tolerate things slowly. Visual domain prefers low light, squints or get headaches, likes to wear caps or visors or sunglasses. That's kind of common. You know, refusal to take off those sunglasses when you think, again, behavioral problem, but it's helping the child, um, you know, from that light that's so irritating. Uh, sometimes a cap with a visor, and now there's this big struggle because they're not supposed to wear um, caps in school. But if you find out there's a sensory reason for this, we can make accommodations, we can make exceptions, but we have to understand that part of it. But when you see that struggle happening, it's something you might wanna um, say, aha, maybe I ought to think about that. Disturbed by fast moving images like riding in a car, that can be really upsetting to some people. They might start refusing to ride in cars or the bus. Um, you can, um, you see avoiding or threatening by eye contact, seems like a kind of a funny thing, but could be uh, sensory uh, issues underneath there, or react strongly to flickering lights. We see that a lot, those, those horrible um, fluorescent lights that flicker away. Um, Two couple strategies, this boy has a hood on. Very commonly seen in people with um, visual hypersensitivities, that hood kind of protects them. It, it protects their uh, peripheral vision a little bit. And it kind of gives them a little head space, a little space of their own. Um, on the right is are these wonderful screens that you can get with clouds or other visual things that you can put right over those um, those fluorescent light boxes up on the ceiling and cut down on that kind of uh, stimulation because often it's very low level. It's you and I probably wouldn't even know notice it, but the um, person uh, is really bothered by it. The olfactory domain, bothered by smells others would ignore, bothered by perfumes and soaps and scented candles. Now, you know, again, there's a lot of range of what's normal. It can be somewhat sensitive. I, When I walk into um, a gift shop very often, all those scented candles and, and, and so on, oh, it just drives me crazy. One problem is for many of those uh, shops, those are chemically um, made 
scented candles and they're not true natural smells like you would get with your essential oils and they can be much more aversive just something to keep in mind if someone does if you are using um, aromatherapy type things you really need to be careful to buy excellent products like from Bath and Body don't want to get anything with these man-made chemical smells and or you want to use your your true essential oils um, the fellow with a chemical smell because of plug-in air freshener. Those are coming very popular lately. Can trigger people. Um, they can complain the cafeteria smells bad. They can be sensitive to body odors. Couple smell strategies. You can make your own little scented spray. Um, 20 drops of an essential oil, half a bottle, it's a small, half a bottle of witch hazel and half distilled water. And I'm not talking about spritzing this around the room because who knows if there's 30 kids in the room, a couple of them aren't going to like this. But what I am talking about, if someone responds to uh, a certain scent or likes a certain scent, you can spray that on a little piece of um, felt cloth or, or uh, fabric and let them keep that in their pocket. They can keep taking it back out and give a little whiff of it. It can calm them down, can be very effective. I learned that from an adolescent program in Chicago. They used to do this with the uh, adolescents at night. If they wanted to come down to the nurse's station, they could get Get their fabric and, and their spritz of a smell. Some of them rubbed it all over their pillows and it really helped them. Very popular activity with adolescents, really helped them with their sleep. On the right is a smell canister that we use for grounding. Um, you just put that piece of cotton in the canister. And may, some of you might not even know what a film canister is, but they were very um, common and very uh, actually a very good thing to use for this particular thing. And put that cotton in there, give it a spritz of the perfume, and again, the person would take it out and smell it, almost like smelling salts in a way, if they were having a really hard time or needed grounding. This is a non ongoing trauma issue uh, with someone. Taste and oral motor domain, gags on textured foods, avoid certain textures. We see this a lot in autism, just like brushing teeth or going to the dentist. Um, some strategies that really help, chewing gum. It isn't the gum that's a problem, it's where people put it afterwards. Or it's that snapping sound that might drive the auditory person crazy. So, um, but gum is very, very calming and, and grounding. Um, you know, that's why those, those, um, those pitchers and ball players chew on that tobacco. It helps their attention. It helps them pay attention. So um, really important strategies. Um, having a lollipop in your mouth. Think of all the moving around of that in your mouth. It's very, very um, strong sensory input actually an activity idea is to have the um, person have their own water bottle with them and to drink through um, this one would have the straw right in it slow small repetitive sucks and swallows could uh, be very helpful to them tactile domain probably the most common um, reacts to someone touching them. They might even strike out. It, it's so they that that's so stressful for them. They might strike out at you. Dislikes having their hair combed or cut. Dislikes showers. Hates going barefoot. Uh, really irritated by the clothing and the tags, like the gentleman at the state hospital. Likes dislikes messy in general. <laughs> Messy textures on the hands particularly. Strongly prefers hugs. Hug touch is much more calming. Dislikes being in line. Dislikes crowds. You start noticing a kid's acting up every time he gets in the line. Well, he could be, um, you know, tactically defensive and that's really a hard thing for him to tolerate. So a few depressure strategies. And the thing about these is, this is why we're mentioning a couple more of these, is because they can be used to help with any of these hypersensitivities to help people calm down. That beanbag tapping, that picture of me in the left-hand corner is me with my beanbag. 
and I'm doing this strong pressure touch tapping on my hands, up your arms, very, very strong, down the other arm, down your legs. There's a, a handout in your package that describes how you do beanbag tapping. Um, excellent to use. I used it in lieu of brushing sometimes with people who are really sensory defensive and set up a program with them with the tapping. It's a lot easier to do. There aren't as many things that, that you can do wrong. Um, it's something you can do in a whole group if you don't want to, um, you know, single out a particular kid. Um, and it's it's kind of, it feels good afterwards. I, you know, especially when I do it in a group, I ask, you know, um, how do you feel? I, I say, okay, stop. How do you feel? And you feel all tingly. It feels good. It really brings attention to your body. Uh, that little um, belt in the middle there is a, like a, a, a wood exercise belt and uh, you wrap it around you and it's got Velcro and oh that feels so um, calming and you feel so together so grounding and that can be worn under a shirt no one even, ha even has to know uh, that you have it on. On the right hand side, that picture of me is I have a lycra hug, a piece of lycra I got at the at Joanne's fabric, 18 inches that comes very wide, and um, and you just wrap it around you, and it is oh, it's a fabulous thing, so easy to have in the classroom. Real somebody really needs to be calmed down. The uh, cap that you see on that fellow, that's giving sensory input, that's weighted, and it's giving it through that whole body. So it's keeping, it can keep him calm, you know, all, for a long time. You don't want to leave it on all day. After a while, it could start irritating him, even though he doesn't really realize it. Uh, the bottom left is my therapy dog, my famous dog that I take with me everywhere I go. He's filled with seed corn. Now I tend to use more aquarium rocks. Uh, however, he weighs about nine pounds. If I handed him to you, oh, you would just melt. It just feels so nice. Um, so very easy to make. You just get a realistic animal and um, give him a little appendectomy and put some aquarium stones that you can buy in the dollar store inside them and it gives that nice weighted friendly uh, deep pressure. Uh, the Medi bead lap pad is just a way of getting a little deep, deep pressure. You can warm it, you can cool it. Um, those sleeves, those are shooter sleeves, very popular with the adolescents. They put them on their arms and it just gives that constant uh, pressure, almost like tight sword, uh, to the arms. And the picture on the right is my colleague at UMass with a weighted blanket, which we know can really help some kids out that you're going to use this in the school situation. Um, in the movement domain, uh, people can get anxious or distressed when the feet aren't on the ground. Avoids jumping and climbing, fearful of stairs, elevators, escalators. Uh, avoids the swings. Kind of hangs out in the in the um you know in in the play yard and and doesn't really want to participate with other people. And why is he just being isolative, or is that really bothering him? We need to find that out. Uh, anxious when pushed or moved by someone, and I mean, over, nobody likes to be pushed by someone, but someone who really reacts if someone uh, pushes them, even by mistake. So some movement and vestibular strategies, very strong strategies can be used again for to help with almost any of these hypersensitivities to help calm somebody down, particularly if there's any trauma involved, um, swinging in a swing, um, walking, jumping on a BOSU ball, which is on the lower left, um, one of those um, seats that you can put a cushion that you can put on the seat that the person kind of moves back and forth almost as if they're on a ball uh, that's a vibrating pillow that someone can squeeze and and hold don't do that for too long you don't want to really set off anything with that you can overdo um, that vestibular strategy vestibular especially if it's not linear rocking linear rocking is the fastest way to calm someone down sometimes you see that behavior you see someone rocking back and forth don't take that behavior away unless you're going to substitute something else that works for the person Now here's something that I did not know about for a long time as I was teaching, and that is the interceptive domain, the interceptive sensors that we have. 
And that those are the internal sensors that let us know when our stomach is upset, when we have a pain going on internally, when um, we're hungry or thirsty or any of those internal senses. It's also um, headaches and muscle pain. Um, these are the kids that end up in the nurse's station all the time with these vague discomforts. They really are overly sensitive in this interceptive domain. They feel a tummy ache that other kids would be so busy they wouldn't even notice. Um, so all those elementary track sensations can be very, very hard for them. So interception answers the question, how do you feel? But we can always also use this idea of how do you feel? Because if you can call attention to the fact that someone uh, is having a hard time, where do you feel it, I like to ask. Do you feel it in your shoulders? Do you feel it uh, in your tummy? Do you feel uh, like your leg shakes? Or do you get a headache? What happens when you're really upset or really angry or, or something? Um, and it's good to know that because if you can calm them down and then ask them again, hey, how, how is it going with that headache? Does it feel any, bad, any less? How's that tension in your shoulders? Do you think you're a little more relaxed? And if they say yes, if that intervention helped, it gives them a sense of control. There's something I can do about this. I can use that intervention and help myself. And that's really uh, important. So these are early warning signs for some kids that crisis might be coming or something's happening. They get goosebumps or tears or their hair stands on end or their throat gets tight or sweaty palms or um, whatever, thumping heart. So here's explosive Betty. Betty doesn't, didn't recognize it when she would get angry. She just would explode before she even knew what was happening. And she can't contain it because she doesn't know how it's starting, and it's always too late. And bad things happen when bad this happens to Betty. She hurts herself, she hurts others. People tell her she has to stop but to control herself, but no one tells her how to begin to do that. So they worked with her, and she came up with the idea that when she was really getting upset, she had a tiger in her tummy. That's how she explained it. It was her tiger in her tummy. And she started to recognize when the tiger was coming. And so she was taught to go to her teacher. And she would just make a growling sound. And the teacher would know, OK. Um, so her teacher would take her aside and talk to her softly, which is a strategy to help the other person calm down, too. And the teacher would ask, you know, do you feel your tiger? How angry is he? maybe on a scale of one to 10. Oh, he's nine, he's really bad. Uh, so they hum together. That's a wonderful strategy that makes people calm down, just humming together. Hum for as long as you can. Hmm. Hold it for as long as you can together. Or toss a coos ball. Or do some chair push-ups. Or smell her special scent ball. So once the interventions happen, the teacher asks again, how upset is the tiger? And when Betty realizes the tiger's calmed down, she can go back to class. So a way of sort of visualizing this, of, of breaking into that interceptive process and figuring out what it feels like and how we can control it. So we have some formal assessments for children. Um, the main one out there is a sensory profile. I was very glad to discover this a sensory profile too, which is uh, even a, a better adaptation of it. Um, and it's designed to pro promote self-evaluation of behavioral responses to everyday sensory experiences um, and its effect on functional performance. Here's our role. It's not just that this sensory stuff happens, it's because it interrupts occupational performance. We are the people that that's, that you know need to work with that. So you just don't discover this sensory thing. You find out what is it interfering with and how can we work with this. Um, 
the sensory profile is well studied. It compares to social norms. It's a family of assessments, says one um, manual. And there's an infant, toddler, child profile. Um, and it, you know, but it has quite a few um, items to it. Um, it's non-intrusive, has a strong theoretical base. It considers the sensory systems, behavioral issues, sensory processing problems, school factors, and includes some intervention strategies. So it can be a very useful tool. Um, again, we saw these before, the low registration and the uh, person who's sensory seeking, that sensory sensitivity that we're focusing on, sensory avoiding, still because of the sensory sensitivities. So it gives us a way to uh, look at these sensory processing problems. However, the problem with this is that when I talk to therapists and I ask them if they're using the sen this sensory profile, very often they tell me, yes, I know use it, but I don't really get how it's helping me. Very common response, unfortunately. It's not saying it has it doesn't have its uses. It does. But sometimes it doesn't give us the real information we're looking for fast enough and quick enough. And one of the reasons that I decided to uh, do this webinar was because one of my colleagues who works with kids came to me and said, um, you know, she was one of these people that said, you know, this the, this new school she had gone to, they want me to do a sensory assessment on this on this child, um, but I don't know what it's going to tell me. I just don't find it useful. The only one out there I can find is um, the sensory profile, and that's not going to help me. What what could you suggest to me? Um, so we, uh, I sent her some of these informal evaluations, I call them, and you can find them throughout my books, um, and you have them in your handout. I've shared them with you. Uh, the detect and bothersome input is kind of an imagining activity. It looks at different environments and activities throughout the day. It's kind of a life in the day and, and what's happening all through the day and when, when are you having trouble and what is it that's happening that, you know, when are those troubled times? What's going on at that time? And it helps us determine times or activities that might be problematic. So imagine you're waking up and getting dressed and having breakfast. Any problems? Imagine you're on your way to school, taking the bus. Any problems? Imagine your classroom. What do you like and dislike? Any problems? So it helps us figure out where, you know, where the person might be having these troubles. What are the hard times of the day? What are the things that's causing uh, difficulties? This sensory history screening is, is a little more involved. Um, it asks some questions in the beginning, things that I want to know about their background. What I'm looking for is um, maybe some hints that there's a trauma history. I want to know their living situation. Who do they live with? What's their medical history? This is for the person who's really having, we, now we need to figure this out, really having a hard time. We're not sure where it's coming from. Maybe there's trauma under there. Maybe it's just a really high amount of um, hypersensitivities. Um, the nice thing about this little screening is that it asks questions about their areas of strengths and then about problem areas in domains, in, in occupational domains of hygiene and grooming. What's happening is a person getting so upset just getting ready for school that the time to get to school, they're a mess. We see that often, very often in children with autism, that's a problem. Uh, is it area problems with nutrition because of the whole, you know, sensitive sensitivity to the textures? Is it getting in the way of relationships or socialization or mobility or school? or leisures, or hobbies, or exercises. So please, you know, I'm hoping that you'll take these um, different evaluations, simple evaluations, and try them on a few people. Answer them yourself and see what you answer to these questions. Try them on your kids. Try them on your best friend. Find out a range of, you know, what's normal with these, these different things and what could be um, maybe up in the abnormal range because people are going to have these sensitivities. They're out there and it's all part of being normal until it starts interfering. The sensory discovery uh, workshop is just another one, a new, newer one. It comes from the curriculum from self-regulation. Uh, 
Um, and its pr purpose is to uh, identify bothersome input. It's kind of simple to do. Uh, you could have a parent fill it out. It's useful in group. Uh, treatment even. Um, and there's factors for vision, hearing, smell, oral motor touch, moving balance, and spaces. Um, an example when the vision would be circle anything um, that bothers you, M for mild, S for severe, bright lights, dim lights, flashing lights, strobes, flat light, fast moving images, and so on. So just one sheet, it's pretty quick to do. Now, the gal that I was talking about took some of these and used them with her, her uh, young man and had a very successful um, outcome for it. She was able to kind of discover the things that were problematic and what was going on and what was interfering, able to show um, the school and the parents, you know, what she found and why why some of these things were happening. And she she um, thought this was a huge success. Um, try, she, and another uh, client had come forward that she was working with, same kind of thing, just having a lot of uh, success using these more what I call informal ways to look at sensory sensitivities. We can even play a game, what bothers you game? And the uh, cards for that, so to speak, are in your handouts. And they're small cards with possible sensory triggers on it. Um, and examples are, you see, so you pass them out, and a person um, reads it and says, uh, noisy places, does that bother you, you ask? It can be a whole group of kids. Most of them don't have any problems at all. You'll be surprised what their answers might be, because again, there's a large range here. What, what do you think about noisy places? Oh, they bother me, they don't bother me. Uh, flickering lights, it's just a way to kind of pull on this in a way that's not threatening, that can involve other people. And then someone mentions the fact that, um, you know, loud, loud sounds really bother them, really bother them. And what, and, and so Joey, what happens? Well, I can't study, I can't, I can't think, I get upset. And um, so maybe you discuss that with the class and say, gee, Johnny's having a hard time. I think we need to be a little careful that we make sure that he's comfortable. And um, sometimes when I tell you to, you know, kind of, we have to kind of be a little quieter, um, that might really help Johnny. So we want to work together on this. Um, so the games and the directions are there for you. And there's this little sheet on sensory sensitivities. What can we do? And it's something to drag out and talk about. We can eliminate it. We can, um, you know, if it's uh, noise, some, some we can eliminate, some we can't. If a person's having a hard time with the noise in the cafeteria, we may not be able to eliminate it. We may have to avoid it. But we can't avoid everything. We can't not ever go to lunch. We might start working with the person, bringing them down to lunch, maybe after everybody settles down a little, and having them leave lunch before everybody gets up and starts moving around. Strategies. We could have them get used to it slowly, little bits at a time. We can work around it. We can use a sensory tool to help. Have that thing that's that snow uh, scrap of fabric in your your um, pocket and take it out and give yourself a little relaxation burst before you face the uh, going down to that cafeteria. Um, you can change the time. You might bring them down at a different time. You can um, set a certain time. Okay, uh, do you think you could tolerate it for five minutes? Let's try it today. And five minutes is pretty doable. Well, maybe next time it could be 10 minutes. So again, slowly adjusting yourself. You could relax afterwards, have the person, you know, because they're pretty going to be pretty revved up after this aversive stimulation. Um, maybe there's something afterwards that you could do um, to relax. Um, and you want to get them to start telling somebody to ask for help. That's huge. They don't. They're not. They're blowing up and exploding when really they, if they once they recognize that this is happening, all they need to do is ask for help around it. Solve a lot of problems. So overcoming sensory issues. We don't want to support escape behaviors. We want to work with them, but we don't want to have them put on those headphones all day long. Um, we want to use positive reinforcers. We want to use praise and reward of their strategies. We want to encourage the use of tools, model good behavior real time. 
Wean the behavior in small increments. Expect setbacks. If they're going to get set, and don't get all bent out of shape about a setback. Looks like you're just having a bad day and you're, you know, you're not doing as well with that as you usually do. So, you know, maybe we need to do something different for today. Allow reasonable accommodations like earplugs or whatever, um, and make aware of upcoming challenges. Joey, you know, we're going to uh, go down to, uh, you know, the gym today, um, and there's going to be a lot of kids down there, and they're going to be, you know, using bouncing that basketball, and it kind of echoes, and I know you have trouble with that, but, um, but it's just for gym class, and I think if you could just ignore it a little bit and, and try to participate, you might forget about how much it bothers you. Who knows? You want to work with the child. Um, these are tried and true intervention strategies that come from the STAR Center. Um, they, um, Lucy Miller from the STAR Center came uh, to one of my conferences. She is the one who told me about the idea that they were talking about an eighth sensory system called interception, which you're probably taught about that now, but I hadn't been when I was uh, first uh, in school. Um, and the stars, she has a book called um, No Longer a Secret. Some of these strategies are from that. It's, it's a very interesting book because all of her suggestions and so on come from all this experience and research that happens here in the STAR Center. Um, you have several slides on this. I had to eliminate some of them because um, for, for the sake of time. Um, but these were really important ones. I love that she says, calmness is catchy. Make sure you, the therapist, is calm and well regulated. Ah, that's critical. It's catchy. If you're not calm, the person's not going to be calm. You take the person aside, talk very slowly and calmly. It's going to help them regulate themselves. So that's critical. Make sure you are calm and well regulated. You might need to take a little time out before you work with a particular person. You might make sure you don't come in from your fray of life and jump in to work with these kids when you're still, you know, not all that regulated. So um, do what you need to do. Have your strategies. Um, think slow, low activities. Give them slow, keep the input low, give them time to adjust. Help reach a balanced state by using massage or deep pressure touch or vibration or a heavy lap pad, something to help the kid reach that balanced state. And one of her favorite things is heavy work, and I think heavy work is one of the most important things to do. Um, that's the strong proprioceptive input. It's calming and organizing. Try helper tasks. That's my favorite. Looks like you're having a hard time today, Joey. Wow, something must be up. Uh, could you help me bring these books down to the office? I'd really appreciate the help. Maybe we could chat on the way down. Maybe you could help me rearrange the chairs. This room is really distracting me, and, and uh, I need to get it um, back together a little bit. Could you help me do that? So carrying heavy objects, lifting, pulling, squeezing, vacuuming, that was one of the solutions that my colleague who used some of those um, uh, informal evaluations came up with. I know that using heavy work was something that her mom really identified with and they set up some things for the child to do at home that um, he could feel pr proud about helping with and so on. And that turned out to be sort of their, their main solution was this heavy uh, work. It's very interesting. Also, Lucy Miller talks about a time in space. I love that idea, time in instead of time out. So if the child is having a hard time, maybe there's a place they can go for just a few minutes or whatever. Sometimes you need to set up rules around it. Can't have the kid running to the space every five minutes, but give them a getaway. Use a timer to limit the time. You can have a pup tent or a cardboard box or a cloth over a table. Um, and start with clue, cues to suggest the child take a break or work towards the child using it independently when needed. Uh, a good example of this was the Chauncey Hall Chill Out Room. Chauncey Hall was an adolescent unit that I went to many times and worked with them. They came up with a great 
sensory room. Um, they uh, the adolescents uh, live there, and so they have their their teachers uh, come in um, and work with the kids right there. And when I first went there, uh, they didn't want any part of coming to my lecture. They uh, just didn't um, feel it was necessary for them. And so they were kind of resistant to some of the things we talked about uh, for alternatives for the kids, like a certain child sitting on a ball or so on. And they were having a hard time. They had set up a chill room next door to the classroom. And it was simply a big room. It really wasn't a sensory room. It was just a big extra room a luxury that we all often have, but anyway, and they put a beanbag chair in there and a few very simple tools that, you know, the child could use. And uh, what we're suggestion was, was that if a child was having trouble, that they allow to go in and, and uh, calm down in the chill room. Oh, we can't do that. All the kid, all the kids are going to want to do it. There was a million excuses, but they did give it a try and they found it worked great. And some of those strategies, like the ball uh, or the TheraBand against leg, started realizing it was working for everybody. Well, next time I went there, they were all there at the um, lecture. So they were new converts. Um, so take an empty room, put in a beanbag chair, maybe a video rocker, a few sensory tools, allow the kids to use it when they need to chill out, and voila, you have sort of a little sensory room. I'm big on comfort spaces at home and helping the child and the parents design a space at home where they can chill out, a space that's theirs, that they can go to that has some tools already there for them, things that they've chosen, things that help them. And when they go to their space, you can set up rules. It's like, I'm in my space, nobody come bother me. Okay. And you might even find that um, you um, have the person go to the space before something upsetting is going to happen, like they're going to have to go to see the doctor or even before they need to leave for school. And so they have they have some time in that chill out space um, where they can just kind of group, regroup themselves, use a few of those tools. Um, it can be before school, after school. Um, before bed, just to have, don't go, you know, sometimes sleep hygiene, we don't want to do it right in the bed itself, but if you had this little space, it doesn't have to be a room, and it's better if it's not in their bedroom. It's better if it's a kind of a quiet corner of, let's say, the family room, or maybe, I don't know, a place by the stairs, or, or just some little place that's kind of theirs. Um, there's a study, the Anderson study, uh, used the strategy of a safe place. They often use the bedroom where they could withdraw from sensory input and regroup. And this strategy was used in acute situations, but also for resting and preventing and lots of um, uh, nice um, evidence that this was a very helpful thing to do. This is the beanbag tapping. Uh, I used a lot of this with the women uh, that I did the Will Barger protocol with. Again, it gives healthy touch to the body. Sometimes you have to remind people of that. I've had people say, oh, sure, you want me to, to uh, hurt myself? You want me to? No. We are doing healthy touch. This is helpful to your body. It really, um, when I do it with uh, people, uh, it's a kind of amazing. You start seeing their posture improve. Um, I would do it in groups, and I would say to the students who would come to the groups, watch after we do this beanbag topic. We want to talk about this later. You keep your eye on a certain uh, client and tell me what happens afterwards. And they would come back and say to me, oh, it was like a miracle. That person started talking. They started making eye contact. I mean, it's a very powerful tool. And bean bag can be simple. You can make them yourselves. There's directions on my website. You can take a sock and throw some um, seed corn or or uh, don't don't use um, 
aquarium stones for that, but rice is good because rice you can even put in the microwave or even in the freezer, um, tie off the stock really hard and use that for beanbag tapping. You can even use it before your little group that sits down together, uh, before you start an activity. It will help with their attention. It will get them in the program and it's going to be really helping that kid who might be struggling a little bit. Uh, teach breathing strategies. Uh, the directions are in your, your handouts. Um, deep breathing, I'm a big one for just four deep breaths. And, you know, take, put your hand on your abdomen, puff out four times. Deep breath in. Hold. Out slowly. As if you're blowing out a candle. We don't have time to practice this today. I can't see you practicing it, but usually I do this four times. And the last time I say to them, okay, on that last breath out, I want you to just oh, melt down into the chair. Um, and, you know, very often this is the strategy that helps people the most. And it's you always have it with you, you can always do it. Another very powerful strategy is called Vu breathing. The kids might find it funny. They also might be self-conscious about it. When you do the breathing out with a vu, you, you make this, this sound that's kind of a foghorn sound. You can look it up on the internet and see little videos of people doing the vu breathing. It's, it, it's, it, it's unusual, but what it's doing is, according to Stephen Porges, it's um, affecting that vagal nerve, and it truly is very, very powerfully calming that system down. So when you're working with hypersensitivities, um, consider the sensory possibilities. Sensitivities are on a continuum. This is just a little review. Sensing defensiveness is the extreme. You need to ask, is trauma or neglect? I used to think um, being hurt in trauma was the worst thing. Actually, that's not true. What's the most, the worst thing in trauma is neglect. It's sensory deprivation. That's why seclusion is such a horrible strategy. People think it's better than uh, restraint. It's not. It's a horrible, horrible strategy. Um, so it's something we never want to be doing um, to bring a person to a quiet space or a, a, a you know a, a sensory room that's different that has a positive connotation we're going to do positive things there we're going to give the person tools that's nothing like seclusion sensitivities are seen across all domains there's formal assessments like the sensitive profile too but informal assessments can be really helpful too and again Go home and practice some of those. See what you think. Try it with a few people because I don't want you to just take these handouts and put them away and never use them again. I want you to try them. I want you to use them. Um, treatment strategies must be chosen with the child and the family. It's a co-regulation. It's, it's working together to come up with this treatment plan. You can't do it just with the family. The child has to be helping pick out these things. Even if they're nonverbal, you still can work with them to see what they're really responding to. Um, and they really, they need to be part of this whole process. And if you're going to want things to be uh, done at home, the family has to be on board too. The family has to understand why they're doing these things. If you're going to ask the family to do some being back tapping to the ch with the child, they have to understand what it's all about and how you do it and why you do it. Um, and because so if they, if you want them to be converts, they really need to have that understanding increase. You need to practice these strategies in real life. So you give the kid a strategy, but then you have to integrate it into them using it during the classroom, using it when they're not, when they're starting to feel upset. Just having the strategy isn't good enough. Provide worksheets and directions for follow through to the family or even to the teacher. These are some things we found helpful. You know, try these things with Johnny when he seems to be having a hard time. So that's it for me for today. I know you're going to have some questions, and Allison's going to help us with that. 
Um, and don't forget to live sensationally. Wonderful. Thank you. So the first, can we go back to that slide about your um, the conference that you're doing for CAOT? People are just looking for that information. One more time. Oh, sure. I never thought in my life I would ever be doing an online conference. When they first talked about this, I said, oh, no, I can't do this. I'm too old. That's too much of a learning curve. Uh, but my colleagues had talked me into it, and they said, Karen, all you have to do is the presenting part, and um, and you do that all the time. Um, and so we'll do that, the hands-on, uh, you know, part of it. Uh, so I uh, agreed to do it, and uh, now that I'm doing it, you know, it, it's different. I just had to make up my mind it's going to be different. Usually when I do conferences, they're very interactive. And I go and I talk with the audience and I show them things and and we try things together and I bring all my tools and they they you know and this can, couldn't be diff more different in many ways from that but I found it had advantages too I found that you know giving people homework to do so they help integrate this um, there there definitely are positive pieces to it so we'll see you know it will be my my first online experience other than doing small webinars like this one although this one is helping me to get ready um, so anyway it's offered twice as I said um, it you do it over um, a two weeks you there are uh, nine hours of videotaped uh, lessons trying to make them as sort of interesting as possible with little videos in, in with them um, there are four and a half hours the first week, and that's broken up into two modules, and there's homework to do in between. And then at the end of that week, you work with Peggy and Megan in an interactive webinar, and you try out some of these things and talk about things and how they worked. Um, there's a limit of 24 people um, in those um, those interactive webinars. Um, each session has two different uh, classes, so to speak. So there's 50 people total, but only 24 per lab um, and in order to accommodate as many people as possible they're offering it twice once in uh, September and then the end of October wonderful all right one of the first questions coming in is I'm looking for strategies to deal with extreme boredom and sensory sensitivities to teeth brushing the feel of the bristle bristles taste of the toothbrush not brushing hard enough and bored distracted also wanting strategies to deal with kids who hate the sound of chewing okay hate the sound of chewing imagine that interesting we, the what we don't even notice um, well, you know, there's a lot of oral motor strategies that we can use, you know, white swiping the mouth with, um, while well, we have different tools. I know that there's lots of tools for that that um, Therapro has. You can even uh, take a face cloth and put your finger in it and swipe around the mouth, preparing the child uh, for uh, the input of the, of the um, uh, tooth brushing. Um, is, this can be pretty um, uh, common. Um, using a, a vibrating toothbrush might help or it might freak them out and they don't want to do that at all. Um, using during the day, not during the times around the toothbrushing, but do oral motor kinds of things, um, different strategies and like having uh, chewing on that, that lollipop, moving it around in your mouth. You, there's plenty of um, sugar-free versions of that, um, doing those kinds of exercises. Actually, uh, one of the gals in, in the, uh, in the um, study that I did well, had terrible problems with the tooth brushing. That was one of her issues uh, that did the Will Barger protocol. And um, it was very interesting to see. We did it for a month. And at the end of it, um, I asked her how the tooth brushing is going. And she said, why are you asking? And I said, because you were having a hard time with it. And she said, well, I don't have any hard time with that anymore. And so very interesting. Um, you know, so so you can you can get at it in many different avenues, um, and the boredom. I don't know. You know, maybe the person is just you know got a really high threshold and you're not reaching it. Then maybe more needs to be going on. Uh, maybe having them do something while um, they are fiddling around with something 
while they're trying to pay attention or while they're doing something else. Um, you don't want to feel that everything has to be, you know, a Sesame Street act with things coming at you from every um, angle. You know, kids do have to get used to, um, you know, the classroom environment that always isn't, you know, real um, invigorating. Um, but maybe part of the, you know, maybe they need breaks. Maybe they need to go outside and, and rev up their system a little with some, um, you know, some kind of activity. Maybe you need to get the whole class up and doing jumping jacks or doing something, I call them sensory breaks, doing a few chair push-ups and build it into your classroom and have everybody do it so one person isn't singled out. So especially on this online stuff, can you imagine how boring that is for kids? Stop, have a break. Everybody needs to do, you know, some kind of sensory activity. Um, so taking breaks for that. And I think I forgot what the third one was. <laughs> That's all right. It was so do you, yeah. yeah. Do you have a good resource for children's books for kids with the sensitivities and good children's book for siblings with kids with, with sensitivities? I don't. I don't. But if is there a way if I um, you know, talk to some people who are working with these that um, I, I gave you the one book for parents. That was definitely for parents um, the, from the SAR Center. Um, but if I got those uh, to you, Allison, is there a way that people could, um, you know, uh, get that information? Absolutely. We can post it on our social media page um, and maybe in our blog posts we can put it there. Uh, so definitely follow us on Facebook or uh, Twitter and Instagram. We'll put those recommendations up there. Um, and if you don't have access to social media, just email Allison at Therapro and I'll get those to you as soon as uh, Karen gets them to me. All right. Okay. Another question coming in. <laughs> is there time a time that heavy work is not appropriate? I, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule. I mean, obviously, you know, if kids are have any physical issues going on, you want to be careful of what kind of heavy work. But what we're talking about with kids are things like carrying books or uh, pushing around chairs and those kinds of things. And that kind of input, of the, that uh, proprioceptive, you know, deep pressure input is rarely, rarely over um, stimulating. It's the vestibular we need to, I would say definitely the vestibular, you need to be very careful. But that's why the heavy work proprioceptive kinds of things are um, pretty safe to do and usually, uh, you know, don't cause any problems. So they're, they're one of our safest interventions. Um, you can get um, good proprioception uh, to the program by jumping on a, a BOSU ball or a trampoline, but you can overdo that. Um, so there's tons of stuff we can overdo, but just, you know, heavy, you know, heavy work tasks, um, you know, obviously you have to use your common sense, but overall, um, they're pretty safe things to do. All right. When sensitivity defensiveness is due to trauma, should interventions be different? Does that root affect the outcome? Um, I think you need to be careful about the... Um, you, you really need to be careful about how you approach it with the child. You know, I come from a mental health background, so, um, you know, working with trauma is, you know, part of what I do. Um, you can't, as an, one thing I like about occupational therapy, um, even in the mental health uh, field, is that I got to work with those, those folks and um, help them, and we never talked about their trauma. I knew it was there, they knew it was there, but the, that's the nice thing about the sensory strategies is that doesn't even have to come up. In a way, I don't really care what it was. The only thing I care about sometimes is what are the triggers, but the helpful input, the deep pressure touch, the, you know, the um, proprioception, the, the sensory diet that depends on those kinds of things, not, not your external senses. Those can be more triggering. But using your, um, your, your three uh, internal senses, I call them, deep pressure touch, um, proprioception, and vestibular, 
um, those things, um, you can work with them and just give them a sensory diet um find things that they can tolerate sometimes people with uh trauma for example uh, different things bother them like doing exercise and feeling sweat on their own body i mean you never know what it is so you don't make a big deal of that you, they might tell you i don't like to exercise um and you say well there's got to be some things that that you will do that that um you know that don't bother you so let, let's talk about a bunch of them and those are other things that um, there's lots of different ways of doing that exploring those in my books that um, list a whole bunch of different interventions and you can d use that as a checklist let's let's talk about these different things and see if we can identify ones that might be comfortable and then focus in on those so lots of checklists checklists for aversive input some of the ones that I gave you um, in this intervention do do something similar to that but there, there's other just a plain old checklist for aversive stimulation whatever going through them and I would go through them with someone who's had trauma through that aversive stimuli whole long check checklist um, you can do it in pieces if you you know it depends on how young the child is you can ask the parents to kind of go through it see if there's anything that they they know and that's where it might come out the few things that they are really reacting to and then you can kind of problem solve around it I would have met, worked with that child who uh, worked with the um, that had the um, response to that blade to really work with him with a what you know what smells are bothersome to you what kind of quality do they have have you ever encountered this before with um, you know a, you know a, a plug-in or do you walk into a, um, you know gift shops and, and and smell that what are the things that you've worked you know traps have you found before to get him to either prepare himself um, for those or to avoid those kinds of things um, and find out what other kinds of traps that that might be that that's probably not the only thing that bothers them so there's a lot more of there you're doing some of the similar things but you're 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 that that trauma issue is for you up uh, out there up front and and important but you're not talking about that you're staying away from that you're just trying to figure out the triggers the sensory things and then you're trying to find comfortable kinds of um, interventions that um, the person will um, you know will be willing to do and you probably want to get some sort of sensory diet going great another question coming in can we use the sensory history screening um, that you provided as it's copyrighted yes you can the um, I think it says right on your the beginning of your um, handouts that I've given permission for all, all conference attendees to use these these um, things that I've provided to you um, and to just only use them with your own clients in your own system or school um, you can't photoset them on on a large um, scale and give them out to other people um, if you were having a small group and you were uh, kind of um, wanted to do a little, um, um, what do you call them, internal uh, lecture to a few people to let them know about it, and there were you know four or five people attending, you know you could you could share it with them. Um, but these are these are for you and for you to use, and there's permission. And the thing about um, that two of my books the not not the workbook but the first a book all the there's permis similar kind of permission in that to use all of the um, materials yourself and to copy those worksheets and use them with your clients same thing with the, with the curriculum the curriculum comes with a CD that prints out hundred you know all kinds of, of um, games and things to do and and you can make copies of those and um, make make up very easy game packages for yourself you can use the different evaluations in there the sensory sense um, the sensory defensiveness screening is probably my most um, important evaluation that's in the first book 
And um, if you are having someone who has trauma issues, I would definitely do that screening with them. It's also asking if they're doing any uh, self-harm, those kinds of things. It's part of that screening. Um, it's not if a person checks off a lot of things on that screening, the important part of it is you flip it over and then there's a page on functional uh, um, things, you know, fun functional results. And um, the question is, do these proclivities, do these problems that you have interfere with function? And it asks about relationships and hygiene and so on. And that's the key is to know how bad is are these defensive reactions and what are they interfering with? And that's an excellent, um, a little more involved than the, the little ones that I gave you um, in your packet today, um, but a very important one. And again, you have permission to use it if you've purchased the, um, the book. Um, one part of the book is a manual. There's two parts to that book. It's really one book, but one's a manual, one's the handout. handout and, and you can't copy the book the manual, but you can copy all the activities that are in that, um, uh, that um, part that comes with it, that, you know, that, that has all the worksheets and so on in it, the handbook, I'm trying to say. Wonderful. Okay, I have a student who has difficulty with eye contact. She also seems to be very understimulated and needs loud sounds to really catch her attention and redirect her back to class or the session. What would be the best approach for this? Um, well, as I said, I, you know, it's interesting with the um, beanbag tapping that um, what an odd thing that eye contact improved. You know, it can come from a lot of different places. Um, they're not going to um, cure probably, la you know, eye contact because that's a very personal thing. And, and I think it's really hard to sort out exactly why that's happening. Um, you know, lots of diagnoses have that lack of eye contact that just come with it. Um, but you can, um, you know, try to not insist, but do it in a nice way. Please look at me. Uh, can we talk about this? But again, keeping your voice safe and, and comfortable and making them, I mean, you can't do that kind of thing until you have a really good relationship with them and they're willing to make eye contact with you because sometimes it's scary um, sometimes it's just a visual kind of thing, um, but more often it's got a more complicated history behind it. Um, and but but just you know, I, I think that just working with a person, trying different sensory tools, getting them to to um, be comfortable with different sensory tools. If they could find something they could manipulate in their pocket, like two smooth stones or um, something just um, to, to manipulate when, when they uh, need to pay attention or, or to um, make eye contact with people, something to sort of uh, help with that little bit of anxiety that's coming with that. Um, and, you know, I, and I think the same kind of thing with a person who's having trouble with attentional issues. Again, giving them some strategy, whether they have a kush ball that they're allowed to keep in their hand and keep uh, tossing back and forth so they can pay attention more. Um, several of one of the women who came in to talk to me about that study, um, and I was interviewing her and we were going to talk about it. She came in and she announced, I hope you don't mind, but I doodle. I said, oh, wow, that's great. She said, it's great. I said, yeah, that's great. I said, why do you doodle? And she said, it helps me pay attention. I said, I know, that's what I figured. I think it's a good thing if you doodle. It's not that when people doodle, it's not that they're not paying attention. They're probably doing it in order to pay attention. So giving, um, you know, allowing a little doodling here and there or giving them something else. I know they have those little things, the manipulatives that people um, can put in their hands. Some of them are more irritating than others. You need to pick something the teacher's comfortable with putting up with or that doesn't bother the other kids. But, um, you know, just to raise that uh, threshold by having something else uh, going on at the same time, some kind of sensory tool. It might take a while to, to figure it out. 
Awesome. Okay. And so we have a lot of um, viewers kind of giving us some suggestions on books here. So uh, oh. why does Izzy cover her ears um, dealing with sensory overload? Um, we also have My Great Big Feels, a story for sensitive children by C.M. Tolentino. Um, we also have Annie and His School Tools uh, by Jenny Jennifer Vindal. Um, we also have Squirmy Worms by Linda. Um, all right, so let's try oh, to do those one are more. Wonderful. Question. Yes, I'll um, I'll jot <laughs> those down for you. Send them to me so I can put them into the list. Absolutely, we'll get those all jotted down for everybody. All right. Uh, one, let's do one last question before we run out of time, and then I promise you all we will get to the webinar exit code. Um, let's see. What can I do besides fidgets to help kids participate and stay in an area during circle time? Fidgets seem to be more distracting for some kids and also can, just, can distract their peers. True. Um, that, you know, that's the problem with fidgets. You'd have to be careful. Um, I would say that one thing I would do is a kind of preparatory thing and maybe do before it starts, do a little bit of beanbag tapping or do um, something uh, to sort of get that system, uh, you know, uh, revved up and, and paying attention and so on. Um, they, everybody can do, you know, hand hugs or deep pressure tuck. To, uh, touch hugs or do some kind of activity before the circle or as the beginning part, introductory part to the circle, and then uh, see if that helps with the uh, the attention. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Karen, for presenting a thank very you. very informative webinar.